Hello and welcome back to Aging Well. I'm your host, Nathan Lamb. With me today is community social worker, Lisa Waxman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to, great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And also here today, we're welcoming back um, protective service social worker, Nora Awate. Nora, welcome back. Thanks. Happy to be here again. Oh, excellent. So today we're talking a bit about self-neglect, about how Somerville Cambridge Elder Services can help. And it is an area that sort of ties into our central mission as an agency, because for those who aren't aware, we run to people all the time who aren't familiar with what we do. Uh, a huge part of what our mission is helping people uh, live in the setting of their choice, give their options for staying at home as long as they like, um, you know, supporting independence and in their decision making. And I think a lot of what we do to help address self-neglect sort of follows that same philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a great topic because it, it's very pertinent to what we do and uh, hopefully we'll be able to discuss a couple of programs specifically to um, educate our viewers on mm -hmm. that a little bit. And Lisa, uh, there was one program in particular I was curious to learn a little bit more about today. It was the Connect program. Mm -hmm. The Connect Corp program is a great program. It's um, grant funded by our agency and it was um, it was a way to kind of close the gap between what happens when a client either gets screened out of protective services or um, comes out of a connected, um, protective services because their risk has been lowered. So um, what we do in Connect is we meet the clients where they are and we help, as the name implies, connect them to resources. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a way of connecting them to mental health resources, um, helping them connect to um, other services in the community. Um, sometimes we'll see a client maybe who's recently retired and doesn't really have, um, is unsure of what, what they're going to do. Um, and doesn't have much of a social life because they've been working. So we'll help connect them to social resources um, and, and to support them wherever they are. So um, it, it's a great program. I remember we had a piece on it in an industry publication a while back. And our director of clinical, I think she was talking about how it's this sort of fusion between there's a mental health component. Mm -hmm. There's also a social work component. Yes. And the two of them kind of work together to mm -hmm. address the whole person's mm -hmm. um, needs. Exactly. You know, in traditional mental health treatment, a client goes to a clinic, they see a psychotherapist for a 50 minute hour, and they receive the therapy they need. Um, a lot of our clients um, come to us to our program because they're feeling depressed or they're anxious. They may not have a diagnosed mental health condition, and we don't really need to diagnose them to, to work with them. We can just kind of help them work on the symptoms they may be experiencing and um, help, me, help them access the resources that are going to make them feel better. We also help them um, with a little bit of case management and some medical advocacy if that's what they need mm -hmm. and connect with outside providers, as well as working with other departments within the agency. Um, Thinking of specific examples, if I remember correctly, the article listed instances of people who had issues with hoarding, yes. where we connected mm -hmm. people with resources for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other examples of common issues that you're able to help people with through Connect, like the challenges? I think maybe evictions yes. might have been another one. Yes. We do help people with, who are having um, problems with their housing, um, especially around hoarding. Um, in, in helping people accept maybe if they need heavy chore services or just assistance to keep their, their housing um, in, in good shape. Um, they, may not be re they may not be at the level where they would be in protective services where they are in the eviction process, but we want to help them if they're at risk of eviction. So it's important to take the time to spend with these folks and to build the rapport and the trust and, but yet to meet them where they are and to understand that they may be living um, in very small quarters and they have not a lot of space to keep their belongings. So we try to work with them on you know, making sure that they're going to maintain their housing before they hit the, the eviction point. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else you'd want to add about Connect? So it, it's a great program. Um, one of our, um, but it is, it is a great um, a grant funded program so resources are a little bit limited. We do have another program in our agency it's called Community Living Options 
And this is a privately funded um, program. Um, it's private pay. And this is um, an enhanced and very individualized type of um, care, care management program where we can work with people long term and help them access the care and resources that we need. Um, again, depending on what the client wants and what the client um, needs, um, we can meet more regularly with them in the longer term, maybe help them supervise or oversee their care providers, mm -hmm. um, take them to the, go with them to doctor's appointments, provide that higher level of medical advocacy mm -hmm. um, that they need. A lot of times we work in conjunction with other family members or directly with the elder themselves to help them manage the complex issues and needs in their, in their life. So there's a variety of scenarios where that could come into play, but a, a common one would be they need some of the home care services, but they don't meet the eligibility requirements. That could be an option for them if they have the assets to go that route. If they ha yes, if they, if they have the resources to do that, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and there also seem to be a um, slightly higher level of care management aspect, which is a little different, I mm -hmm. think, than home care. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Certainly. So sometimes um, people will see people in our community living options program. They may not have anybody around, a family member. So they just need that, um, they need that extra person to come by more regularly and be in touch with their care providers. Like I said, supervise them, make changes as needed. Um, accompany them um, to, to different appointments um, and, and get involved in their medical care um, in a more in-depth way than we can in any of our other programs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important. And then some of our folks um, in the Community Living Options Program decide that living in their current environment doesn't necessarily work for them. So they may want to pursue other options, not necessarily move, we just want to take the time to pursue other options, which we can do with them. We can re research other living options for them, go with them on those visits, and help them make a clear decision, help them themselves make their clear decision about what they would like to do yes. about their care and about their living situation. So it could be from you need a little extra help to much larger endeavors, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd like to add on that topic before we move on? I guess the only other thing I was curious about is it seems like there's a lot of complicated issues where there's a lot of moving parts mm -hmm. in play. Um, maybe things more going on than initially seems to be the case. How do you go about working through that process to sort of address the underlying needs? Can you tell me a little bit in general, um, how do you uncover the sort of underlying processes while engaging with the people who are requesting? Yeah, I, th I think in protective services, um, we're kind of strangers showing up unannounced mm -hmm. oftentimes at someone's doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, and I've noticed that the, the best way to, at least for professionals to engage is to, well, anybody actually, to be respectful um, mm. first, first and foremost and make it clear that you're there to help mm. and not, not do things against their wishes. Um, I try to stress repeatedly that um, they have the right to self-determination, they have the right to make choices for themselves, and we want to respect that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And the more you reinforce that as a family member or anybody, it's going to make an elder more inclined to disclose things to you or open up. And you might not get to it the first time, even as a family member, especially as a family member. I think sometimes they're not as elders don't want to disclose that something's going on mm -hmm. to a loved one because it's kind of shameful or can feel like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us try to understand that asking for help is extremely hard. Mm -hmm. um, even for any of us, it's hard to ask for help. Um, and I, moving slowly is one thing. Uh, in protective services, we do anything we can to do harm reduction. That's what our focus is. So mm -hmm. if you want nothing else at all, what can we do right now to make you safe? And I think that's approach family members can take also. You can't mm -hmm. just all of a sudden throw in a bunch of services. You need to be slow about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more respect, sorry, the more respectful you are, I think the more an elder will open up about what's going on. Yeah, and sometimes it's necessary for us to speak with family because um, families can tend to rush to judgment because they want the problem fixed now. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, what one person may think is, a, a, what a family member might think is a major issue, the elder may not see as much as the family member. So um, sometimes it's really important for us to get involved in the family conversation to help negotiate that. Um, reducing harm while also respecting the elder's right to self-determination, starting where they are. Like I said, you know, we all, every adult of every age um, tends to self-neglect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just important to keep, keep the conversation going and be respectful and not push too hard because it can backfire. And the elder wants you to be an ally. The older adult needs an ally and somebody who understands them. And that, you know, we're trained to, to be understanding and respectful and to validate. And um, one more topic before we wrap this segment up. Uh, what are the limits to what we can do to help? Because mm -hmm. I, I know we do the best that we can yes. with what we have, <laughs> but um, what are some of the common limits that we run up against in trying to help with these situations? Right. Well, yeah, exactly. There are limits. Um, our programs are voluntary um, for, for our older adults. They can join our programs. If as, and they can also leave our programs. So while we may not agree um, if they're going to leave a program or refuse a service, it's ultimately their choice. Mm. Um, a very common thing that we do see happen is um, older adults will start our home delivered meals program mm. within our agency because you know, if they're food insecure or maybe shopping and meal preparation is very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. um, or they may have some weight loss issues. So we're happy to put in our home delivered meals program. But sometimes we see um, elders decide to leave the program because they don't like the food or um, a, a multitude of other reasons they might stop. You know, it's not our position to impose our will and say, no, 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 you have to have these meals. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we like to encourage them to pursue other options um, and to think about um, the choices that they're making and offer some suggestions, but it's, it's not our, our place to impose our will. Um, we're working with adults, mm -hmm. and um, they're over 18, and as long as um, they're deemed competent by their physicians, which, which most people are mm -hmm. for the, the most of their lives, um, we, need, we need to respect that because that's how we want to be treated. Nora? Um, yes. Going to reiterate what you say, uh, what you've said, but um, with protective services specifically, I think people call when they're really concerned. Um, things have reached a tipping point, and they want help, and they call protective services, wanting us to do something. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do things against people's wishes, barring exceptions where somebody does lack capacity or um, is incredibly unsafe and maybe not cognitively able to make decisions for themselves. Um, so we're not able, we're not child protective services. We have to listen to what the elder wants. Um, and it can be frustrating for loved ones um, that we do have those limitations. And our focus, the agency's focus, protective services, social workers, all of us, we just want elders to be safe, but also make decisions for themselves as much as possible. Absolutely. With that, I'm gonna wrap up this segment. Thanks again. Um, and we'll be right back with our final segment.